Good morning, may it please the court. It's Rabati from the Federal Defender's Office for Mr. Salusi and Lee Tamila. With me at council table is Tony Axel, who has entered his appearance. Mr. Lou Tamila was sentenced pursuant to guideline 2B1.1, which enhances the defendant's offense level based on the amount of, quote, loss. That term is undefined in the guidelines, but the guidelines commentary directs courts to apply the greater, quote, intended loss or, quote, actual loss. That is what the district court did here when it used an intended loss figure of 610,000 in the 2B1.1 loss table calculation, rather than the amount that the victim actually lost, which was $76,069. But why should the court give a defendant who's been charged with a particular crime the benefit of essentially collateral um, help when the money has been returned to a certain extent, as opposed to what they intended to rob somebody of, or in this case, what they actually stole? So that, that, that comes with the plain text of the word loss. And it's important to realize here that in 2B1.1 out of the 20 uh, special offense characteristics, this is the only one that does not use the word the, word the offense. It uses the word loss. It doesn't use the amount taken. Again, it uses the word loss. And loss, the plain meaning of that term, is the amount that the victim actually lost. And that comes from the dictionary definitions that the, that the Third Circuit and the Sixth Circuit cited to. It also comes from the uh, what a reasonable person would understand that term. And you know temporally how uh, when to measure loss. I, I might lose my keys this morning, you know, this morning. Um, I might find them later in the day, but that doesn't change the fact that they were lost. Right. Right, Your Honor. And again, we're asking the word loss at the time of sentencing. No one's asking that word, um, you know, at the time of indictment. When we're writing, when the PSR is being written, being written by the probation officer or the or the judge is sitting down at uh, to sentence the defendant, that's when we're asking the term why, loss. Why is that the, the perfect time? I mean, mm -hmm. Someone could be physically injured; they could be beaten up, and they were injured at the time of the offense by the time of sentencing, which could be years later. They did the deal, they're not injured. Right. And we recognize when we when we assign uh, this calculation to happen at the time of sentencing, we realize what we always realize about sentencing, which is that at the time when the judge has the most perfect information he is going to get, and he's able to account for relevant situational factors that are that are critical for implementing the guideline as written. And that's why, for example, if you have a probation officer potentially saying that you owe restitution, and many defendants will try to get that restitution paid before they come to court. So, so the defense counsel can be very strategic about when the sentencing actually occurs by asking for different conveniences, asking the ability to pay the restitution, and so then loss is lower. Right. Your Honor is correct. Um, but that's where that's where the, the sentencing judge has that discretion, for example, to vary outside, um, you know, using the 3553 factors or, um, you know, to use his discretion to, 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 to uh, both implement the guideline as written, but then also use his ability to vary. And it's important to realize that the, this is the policy call that the, the commission made, right, to use loss and, and, and by using loss to make that calculation incorporating any offsetting amounts, incorporating any recovered amounts at the time of sentencing. If the commission wished to make a different policy call, that policy call is, is their choice and they can do that, but they can't do that in the commentary. They must do that in the guideline. And I wanted to also, um, yeah. So I, I, um, based on this line of argument, yep. I'm not quite understanding why we care about the commentary for the following reason that if you think that actual loss just means actual net loss at the time of sentencing, and that seems to me what you think the plain meaning of loss is, then why why do we care about the difference between actual loss and intended loss? Because intended loss just doesn't figure into it at all through that formula issue. It's just kind of, so the commentary that talks about the possibility of taking the greater of actual loss and intended loss is just beside them. It has nothing to do with this case at all. Well, the commentary, you're right that the, that the loss, the plain meaning of the term loss is the amount that the victim actually suffered. 
basis. And that will necessarily incorporate any recovered amounts, any offsets. That's what you're thinking. No, and, and, yeah. and maybe right. I guess what I'm saying is if we assume that that's your view, then what does the commentary about intended loss have to do with it? Because the language and the concept of intended loss, that's not, that doesn't have to do with the difference between what was initially the loss and then it was late loss at some point later after it's not recovered. Intended loss just doesn't have to do with that. Well, intended, at all. intended loss or, or attempted loss, typically, you know, defend, uh, judges use that term to look at what the, what the defendant originally intended Right, so in this case, for example, it's the six hundred and ten thousand dollars, and that's obviously what is straightforward from the commentary and what judges typically apply in terms in terms of calculating the guidelines range. Now, here, actual loss in terms of what the victim actually suffered is, Your Honor is correct. That is the amount calculated at sentencing that incorporates any recovered amounts. You do not, I guess, need well, the commentary to arrive at that. That's point. your that's your position. Well, I'm saying is. What, whatever the right answer on actual loss means, it could, it could either be what was lost at the beginning or what was ultimately lost counting recovery by the time of sentence. That's the debate. But that debate just doesn't have anything to do with intended loss. It, it has to do with intended loss only to the extent that intended loss was used by the judge, obviously, in this case, as the amount that he wished to in, implement into the guidelines range. Now, obviously, like but it was, you know, sixteen was the actual loss. It, it was not the actual loss because we stole. It was the amount taken in this case, but okay. it wasn't the actual loss because again, we're asking that question at second. No, again, you're um, to go with uh, Chief Judge Shrimp's option. You're you're kind of defining this based on your definition of actual loss, but there could be other perspectives. It's not my definition. It's the it's the common sense understanding, the ordinary plain meaning of the term loss. Which again, as the Third Circuit and the Sixth Circuit said, has nothing to do with what the defendant intended to take, but it's actually what the victim actually lost. We've been sentencing for a long time. I know that myself and um, Judge Wilkins, because we were on the federal trial court, we've had lots of cases where it's intended loss. For example, I've had cases where you have a tax uh, situation. And you are the tax preparer, and you're doing all these types of um, deductions or credits, et cetera, et cetera, to allow somebody to get a bigger return. That gets caught over in, let's say, IRS uh, Center in Dallas or somewhere like that. And so the fact that it got stopped, it doesn't mean that you didn't intend for those people to get all that money back and intend to rob the IRS of those funds. It happens in government um, contracting schemes too. If you overbid it and you um, you know try to get money in that regard too about what you um, <laughs> over contract and over uh, subscribe to what you should actually get paid and things of that nature. So there's a reason for intended loss from the standpoint of what's your mental um, intention with respect to the crime. And so that's why those terms seem to be distinguished out because you should not get credit. And that's what the district court wrestled with. You should not get credit from the fact that somebody else paid it. Even if your mother paid your um, fine or your fee or whatever your probation uh, restitution uh, loss was, that there seems to be at least some sense that you don't get credit for uh, the crime. So, Your Honor, again, we're, we're looking at the term loss as it's written in this guideline. And I'll just point out again that the sentencing, the specific offense characteristics that are used to hike up the defendant's offense level for this guideline use the word the offense every one of the 20 times that <laughs> SOCs are used. But this, but for this uh, SOC, there's only there's a there's one word used and it's loss. It's not amount taken, it's not the offense, it's loss. And loss carries the plain meaning. Of the amount the victim actually suffered. And let me give you so an example. You, you, you have a forfeiture problem with the standard of review. It's plain error. Does the defense agree? And I'm looking specifically at Joint Appendix 76. The defense um, said, as set forth in the pre sentence report, the applicable sentencing guideline range was 51 months. And articulated for a 12 month, one day sentence as a variance. And I didn't see anything 
at the sentencing hearing that changed that. And as a district judge, the first thing you're supposed to do is calculate the guidelines and determine whether either side has an objection to the guidelines calculation and then resolve that objection because um, then you have to deal with departures and all of that, and then you go on to the 3553A factors. We can't have a situation where defense counsel says that the guidelines calculation is correct in the district court, and then comes to the court of appeals and says, no, actually, it wasn't correct. And that seems like what we have here. Your Honor, that, that's that's not correct because on uh, Joint Appendix 134, defense counsel stated specifically that what 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 Mr. Lugamila had a problem with was the actual offense level calculation. It, it was not whether the court should vary, but whether That's the not the language that 134 I'm looking at. It's it's she said what should be measured is the actual loss. That's seventy six thousand sixty nine. And that's where we get the seven plus the six. So she identifies the six, six points as the as the enhancement from the loss table that should be applied, rather than the fourteen points that the PSR identified. And that is an objection. She she's informing the court that she she thinks that the that the court should be using six points as its enhancement for the two B one point one loss table. And that's what the court. Well, that's what to, that's what Rule Fifty One requires. Simply informing the court of the action that the defendant wishes so the court to make. Thirteen. We don't need to get a guy. I'm sorry. But that doesn't even compute because at thirteen we don't get a guideline for twelve to fifteen months. It's like I mean, months, months, and then the court later says. So everyone agrees that the guideline range is over 51 to 63 months, whatever it is. And there's no objection to that at all. Well, I think the objection is here on 134, where she identifies, again, she informs the court that she objects to the the, the, the loss amount. Well, she's clarifying, she's in, again, you don't have to use any particular words. That's what this court held in, in Abney. What she's what she's doing is she's informing the court of the action that she wishes the court to take, or that Mr. Ludomila wishes the court to take, which is to use the seventy-six thousand dollar figure to in in the loss table, and that would result in the quote seven plus the six. That six points right there. That's the enhancement that she thinks that the court um, should arrive at by using the seventy-six thousand dollar figure in the loss table. And again, the threshold from 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 Abney is low. That's what this court said in Brock. It's a very low threshold. It's a straightforward. But uh, this is a specific context of sentence. In Gaul, all of the Supreme Court cases, post Booker and Fanny, would say that the guidelines are rising. Still say that our job on appeal, our first job is to ensure that there's no procedural error. And it translates well, the error is it is to ensure that there's no procedural error and that they calculate the guidelines correctly. The judge, the judge here is a very experienced judge, former federal prosecutor. They didn't pick up that there was an objection to the guidelines calculation here. I wouldn't have. Uh, the whole point of the plain error rule is that we're supposed to, yes, we, we don't put our magic words, but you better believe it, especially if you have written that the guidelines calculation of the PS is correct. You've got to at least bring it sufficiently to the district court's attention that, oh, actually, it's not correct. I shouldn't have said it. I think your honor is. Is um, is right that this is a very experienced judge. Judge Bo Boseberg is extremely experienced, and I think he he he, he recognized that this, and, and he did in fact when he states later on that um, 
you know, I, I don't agree that this is the number I should focus on. He recognizes that she is objecting to the guidelines range, and that's why he states that later on. Um, and so, again, the, the, the amount, the actual losses. I, I don't think so. I mean, she said seven plus the six, which means she's looking directly at the guidelines range calculation, the offense level calculation under 2B1.1 law for the loss table there. She's not looking, she's not making a variance. Uh, seven plus six would be the guidelines range be 12 to 18 months. So, so she she did, uh, she also said later on that I, I think I, I missed, um, you know, I, I didn't add the levels for uh, the, the level I, I missed adding. She says that on 137. Uh, so she corrects her, her her guidelines calculation there. But she she the point is here, she is saying that the, the offense level, the, uh, the enhancement from 2B1.1 should be the six. She is putting that on the record and she is informing the court that that is what the enhancement should be from the 2B1.1 loss table. And it should be that because of the $76,000 figure that should be that should be used. And she identified that it's actual loss. And again, the term actual loss only comes. From the commentary. I mean, Judge Bosberg, again, very experienced judge, knows that actual loss comes from the commentary, and that's how the PSR got to the 610, because it's applying the greater of $610,000 or $76,000. Well, it discuss why we can't look to the commentary. I'm sorry? It discuss why we couldn't look to the commentary. Um, number one, it doesn't necessarily show that the district court um, did because it's not mentioned specifically like the word commentary and I'm looking at it and there's a definition. But even if they did, tell me what's your position about why they could not have. Not because the commentary conflicts with the plain meaning of the word loss. So again, the plain meaning of the word loss is the, the amount the victim actually lost and that must incorporate any offsets or recouped amounts until the time of sentence. And you're just and relying on other circuit precedent for that, nothing in this circuit of Supreme Court. I'm relying on the Supreme Court's decision in Kaiser, which means we have, which says we have to look directly at the plain text of, of the guidelines, uh, of, of, you know, obviously of a, in, of a legislative rule, but by analogy through Stinson, of the guidelines text. But and actually Kaiser, or do, should we also consider Stinson? Well, Kaiser, Clarified and narrowed Stinson, um, and and it did so by saying we must start with the plain text, and if that text is unambiguous as it is here, we don't need to go any further. But you but you're when you say loss, and then you have a commentary that says actual loss versus intended loss. How am I to believe that the text is clear? The text is you, you seem to be defining it that the, and the definition is not there. So as the court knows, we apply the guidelines as written. And when the, the term loss is undefined, and the term loss, because it's undefined, we look typically to the de dictionary definitions. So those definitions mean un unambiguously that loss is the amount loss. As 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 Judge Murphy's uh, but the six ten is what was stolen. So uh, you you seem to be further giving it a um, almost like a sub definition. So the so the dictionary definitions comport with what and they reflect what a reasonable person would understand what common sense would understand. And let me just give you an example that might uh, kind of drive this home. Imagine that you're walking down the street with two $50 bills and a pickpocket takes both those $50 bills. And as he's running away and you're running after him, he drops one and you put that $50 back in your pocket. If your friend asks you what's the loss, any reasonable person would say $50. No one would say $100, right? And that is what what's happening here. He, uh, the, the victim got, $533,000 back, the loss by plain meaning of the word is the $76,000. And, and that, again, it comes from the dictionary definitions, but also from common sense. Uh, and that's what the Sixth Circuit has, has recognized straight from the dictionary um, in, in, in uh, Riccardi and in Smith. Um, and it said that there's, there's nothing in the dictionary definitions that's even close to intended loss. It's also what the, the Third Circuit recognized in Banks. When, uh, when we when when loss is calculated, what do what does the case law say about time value of money and interest? Do we add interest so that if, if a million dollars was stolen and it was three years ago and that had been invested in the stock market and it could be, you know, one point five million dollars or something? Um, um you wouldn't be arguing that um, 
then we look at loss as of the time of sentencing. You would be arguing your client that we would look at loss at the time of the actual death. No, I mean, uh, so the t again, we're, we're saying this is a calculation that must happen at the time of sentencing. And like any actual loss calculation, that can incorporate various factors. It could incorporate an opportunity cost if it was, you know, that, that type of calculation is a rigorous calculation. And we know this, you know, in the restitution context where we, again, can't do, do an actual loss calculation at the time of sentencing. It could incorporate different factors. Here, obviously, it's very straightforward. The actual loss here was seventy-six thousand um, dollars and sixty-nine and seventy-six thousand sixty-nine dollars. Um, that was straightforward because that is the amount. You know, six hundred ten thousand minus the, the five hundred thirty-three thousand dollars that was that was recouped. Um, now, uh, so it's straightforward in this case, and that's what we think. Um, you know, this court should the, the, the district court should have used is that seventy-six thousand dollars. Seventy-six thousand dollars helped. Let me make sure my colleagues don't have additional questions for you at this time, and we'll give you a little time for rebuttal. Thank you. We'll hear from the government now. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Catherine Kelly, on behalf of the United States. Your Honors, in this this case. First of all, Mr. Ludomilo has waived his claim that the district court committed procedural error in calculating the loss amount under 2B1.1. He didn't just fail to raise this challenge in the district court. He specifically agreed in his sentencing memo, and I quote, as set forth in the PSR, the applicable sentencing guidelines range is 51 to 63 months based on zero criminal history points and offense level of criminal force, which included a 14 level increase in this case for a $610,000 loss amount. For that reason, we don't believe the court should even address this case. Uh, if the court is to address it, however, we would ask plain error. Do you think we, the way waiver and plain error, and error intersect is that if you assert waiver, do we have to address whether there was waiver or can we just say, uh, and let's just assume for our argument purposes that you're going to prevail on a plain error, just so I can understand conceptually how this fits together. Uh, do you, is the government's perspective that, well, because you've asserted waiver, because there's a, a factual grounding for potentially finding waiver, that we actually have to decide whether there's a waiver or not, or is a court, does a court have the ability to just assume away the waiver question and engage in plain error? It's, it's my understanding the court could, in its discretion, still, if, if the claims waive, choose to entertain a claim. Even, um, even for waiver? It, I, we, we would say do not, but it, it, in mean, my experience, it has been, I've seen courts say, if it's waived, you can still use our discretion and um, review this question, at least under the plain error review standard, um, which if the court, and we would still say though, in this case, it is an actual waiver because it wasn't just a matter of forfeiting a claim. Here, the defense counsel actually said, in its sentencing memo, we agree that the, the calculation um, of the loss amount is, is correct because they were saying that the, the uh, sentencing range was in fact calculated correctly. And it's very clear that the argument that defense counsel was making in its um, sentencing memo is that fine, the, the, the guidelines range is correct here, but we would like you to vary from that guidelines range very downward to a sentence of 12 months in one day um, based on the fact that, um, in the sentencing memo she was claiming that um, she wanted that variance mainly in light of Mr. Ludomila's history and characteristics and his family needs. Um, she went on to explain, um, and, and this is what, what's different between our argument and the defense argument, uh, Mr. Ludomila at the sentencing hearing did not in fact then create a new issue and say no, and in fact, I do think that the loss amount calculation that set the guidelines range is wrong um, and it should be lower. What, what the defense counsel said there was that, first of all, the, the court should use the, should use the term the court should deviate from guidelines. Um, and then and she actually said that she wanted to explain her, her request for a 12 month and one day sentence. And that's when 
defense counsel got into the argument that really the uh, amount that should be measured here is what she was calling the actual loss. That, and she was saying that that was the $76,000. Um, and then she and analogized to that being a 12 to 18 month range if, if you looked at the, the uh, applicable to be 1.1 loss table. She How uses much, the words base offense level. Yes, the base offense level on page 134. Um, she said that that's a seven, and then she added um, six additional levels for um, an amount that would correspond on the loss table to $76,000. I'm talking about base offense levels and what they should be calculated at. I mean, that's, that's the guidelines calculation exercise, not a variance. It, it, is a, it is an application of the loss table in 2P1.2. B 1.1. However, defense counsel started that point in her argument saying, I realized that she, I didn't lay out my sentencing memo why or how we got to the 12 month and one day request, which was, of course, a variance request in the plain language of her sentencing memo. So essentially, what counsel was doing was saying that the court should vary to a lower sentence to put the defendant in a place that he would be. Um, had he actually only stolen $76,000. But that's not what happened here. Everybody agreed, and I believe we still agree today, that Mr. Ludomila, in fact, stole $610,000. And he should not be given a windfall for the fact that through no help from him, by the time of sentencing, the credit union, with help from E-Trade, was able to recoup approximately $533,000 of that money. Well, what's your response to the... Um... The argument that was before earlier to the effect that if a pickpocket takes two fifty dollars and then drops one, not not about stolen, because I think you're right, everybody does agree with stolen. It's hard to see what this could be with that. But in terms of what the loss is. The, the loss is the loss to the victim, which is in fact, if if unless the victim picks that right up off the sidewalk, he has still lost a hundred dollars. Whether or not the, the defendant ends up holding on to both fifty dollar bills is not really the issue. And it, it's certainly not the issue that in in any realm how much the victim got back by the time the defendant was sentenced. Um, we pointed out the Merriman case in our brief in particular, um, and that, that case makes clear that the purpose of a loss calculation under the sentencing guidelines is to, uh, in, in the fraud situation under 2B1.1, is to measure the magnitude of the crime at the time the offense happens, which is what the court was doing here by saying the offense level is the extra 14 <laughs> levels based on $610,000. That's correct. And Merriman then went on to say the fact that a victim has recovered part of the money they lost by the time of sentencing doesn't have any bearing on a 2B1.1 calculation because it doesn't diminish the defendant's culpability in any way. Um, and of course, the court would be free to look at the guidelines commentary here. And that fits exactly into note 3E of the commentary, which does in some very narrow circumstances give a defendant credits towards the loss amount. But those don't fit here. It, it only gives credit to a defendant for the victim recouping some loss amount if, the, first of all, the defendant had some hand in returning that money. That did not happen here. IDB and Detroit did this completely on their own with no help from Mr. Ludmilla. And if that money is recouped by the victim at some point before the crime is discovered, what we have here is Mr. Ludmilla stealing $610,000 by in full January of 2019. IDB, the credit union, discovered this loss in April of 2019 when they hired a new CFO. And it was after that that they were able to recoup the $533,000 from E-Trade. So that's, again, no help from the defendant and after the crime was discovered. Um, so even if we do look at the guidelines commentary, it just doesn't fit here. Um, I, I think it's quite clear, though, that loss, since everybody agrees it's not defined in the text, this is not a situation where the term loss is unambiguous. Um, the defendant hasn't cited any cases where loss is the amount of money a victim has recovered 
it takes out rather the amount of money that a victim has recovered at the time of sentencing. There's simply no case law that supports that. Um, and in fact, there isn't any case law that defendants support saying that loss as a general matter should just be addressed as what that amount was at the time of the sentence. Are you taking the position that the, the um, guideline, what is that commentary, that the guideline unambiguously favors the government on whether you take into account recovery by the time of sentence? Or are you saying it's ambiguous? So look at the commentary. The commentary makes clear that it's only what the defendant is recovered. I, I'm just saying that the term loss is, is ambiguous in the text of the text. The term loss in the guideline unambiguously uh, rejects the position being put forward, forward by the defendant. I, I would say, first of all, that the, the loss is not defined as the defendant agrees by the text. It just says the word loss, no definition whatsoever. Um, I would say that there is no correlation between what the defense counsel is saying is the plain meaning of loss. So my understanding is defense counsel is arguing that the term actual loss means the amount of money the victim still had not recouped by the time of sentencing. And there, there's no support for that definition, either in the text of the guideline or in the commentary for the guideline. And that if the court were to look at the courts or to look at the commentary of the guideline, it's it's completely unsupported by by that commentary, particularly the three that I've just mentioned. Um, but and I think one of the main things, and again, getting back to the, the plain error point, though, is that certainly the court was not understanding any of this to be an argument about the loss calculation in sentencing guidelines range being incorrect, because it said after defense argument and after Mr. Ludmilla spoke. The first thing the court said was, so everybody agrees that the, the sentencing range is 51 to 63 months. So there, there is no exercise being done by the court here that is indicating that the, the court is accepting its theory, the theory put forward by the defense. Um, there's no information in the record or in the court's ruling that shows that the court was thinking of intended loss here at all. So that, that argument simply does not fit. Um, court didn't use the word intended loss it, in ruling on that very narrow variance of explanation that defense counsel made at the time of the sentencing hearing. The court said, I, I don't agree that the $76,000 is the right amount because that would equate somebody who stole a lot of money with and was, was fortunately caught with somebody who stole a lesser amount of money. So he's really talking about how much was stolen and was correctly focused on what the offense conduct was, not what what the victim covered by the time of sentencing. And we believe the court should affirm that decision. And how does Kaiser fit into your framing? Because it suggests that courts can use traditional use of construction to resolve credibility. But are you just, you know, I just want to know how, if we should be commenting on that particular analysis. I, I don't believe you need to get to Kaiser here because it's first of all, it's not clear that the court was looking at the commentary. The court didn't say anything about the commentary and its ruling. I think, frankly, it was just making a very common sense decision that you, you look at the offense that has occurred. You don't look at what the victim's position is at the time of sentencing in ruling that the $76,000 was not the number that it should examine in determining the sentence here. Um, or, frankly, in, in accepting the argument, the variance argument that the defendant's uh, sentence should be set downward to 12, 12 months in a day. Um, so there's really no reason to look at Kaiser here. If the court were to look at Kaiser here, it's just important to note that Kaiser does not hold that the court has to ignore the guidelines commentary. It only says that um, you look to see whether or not uh, a particular guideline should receive our deference. Um, and in doing that, the first thing you do is to say, do you get our deference? The first thing the court would look at is to say, is this particular guideline am ambiguous? We would say the term loss, since it's undefined as everybody agrees, um, it's ambiguous insofar as it is not clearly creating the definition of defense counsel would like it to have today. Um, 
make sure my colleagues don't have additional questions for you. Thank you, Your Honor. I respectfully request that you approve the judgment. Back in the week, minutes for a Yeah. Um, so I want to start with uh, what <clears throat> what the government was saying about the definition being ambiguous. That that is simply not the case. Uh, the definition of uh, loss is clearly unambiguous, and that follows, you know, from common sense. The government seems to live in some kind of parallel universe universe where the amount taken is a definition of loss, and that is not the case. Uh, that follows again from the dictionary definition, which defines loss as the amount the victim actually lost. It's not the same as the amount taken. And the other point is, again, the guidelines themselves use the word the offense in all 20 of the SOCs except this one. This one uses the word loss, and I, I don't think the government has come to grips with that. That is not the government is, is citing over and over, you know, this is, uh, we have to look at the offense itself. That's not what this lost table is asking this court, to, the, the district court to do. It's asking the district court to look at the term, at the word loss and what that means is the amount that the victim actually lost. Um, the other point is under Kaiser, you can't look to purpose and can't look to commentary to create ambiguity in a guideline that's otherwise unambiguous. And that's again, what the government's seeking to do by looking at, uh, no, through, 3E, it's also looking at the uh, purpose, uh, the purpose um, statement in the background. That is not uh, permissible under Kaiser. Um, the government also claims that there's no case law that says that you look to the net detriment of the victim. There's actually a line of cases um, that say very clearly that for, uh, in, in, in situations dealing with fortuitous recovery, um, the net detriment of the victim is estimated at the time of sentencing. And that's the, that's the amount that the victim actually lost. So that's the United States v. Johnson, uh, 16 F. 3rd, 166 from the Seventh Circuit. There's also cases um, that, that 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 case cites in the, in the Third Circuit and the Ninth Circuit as well. Um, and, and then for the preservation argument, obviously this was not exactly the most artful um, objection, but clearly it was not waived, it was not even forfeited because the district court actually considered the argument and passed on the argument. And there's nothing in this court's precedent that, that says that you can't raise an objection at sentencing um, or even clarify what you said in the sentencing memorandum. Um, that, is what, that is what defense counsel did here. And lastly, I'd point out that um, the, the sentencing guidelines do use, do look at uh, intended loss in, in, the, in the tax guideline 2T1.1. So clearly the guidelines is capable of um, of using and uh, uh, looking and directing courts to intended loss where they mean to, and certainly the guidelines of uh, the commission is able to clean up the guidelines and uh, and 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 make a policy call, but it can't do that, that in the commentary. It has to do that in the guidelines. So we ask the court to um, make it the sentence and remand for reasons. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to both counsel. We'll take this case under submission. Good morning, Council. Good morning. 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 Good
Good morning, Your Honor, and uh, I'm Carolyn Lam. On behalf of the appellants, we have divided the uh, argument, and Ms. Kalinaki will address the appealability and the without prejudice denomination and standing. I'm going to the central issue in our view. Um, I'll, first, there is no subject matter jurisdiction against the foreign state, here Russia, decided in this case under 1605A3. We appear for the appellants, not the Russian Federation. Uh, they are not in this part of the proceeding, but it's our appellants' assets that Abad seeks to take to pay for over $200, $200 million in fines that the district court has imposed against the Russian Federation as a result of their alleged defiance of an extraterritorial injunction to return some allegedly expropriated materials that are in Moscow. There, there is no question on these basic facts. The materials are not here in the United States. There's no allegation vis-a-vis -vis the foreign sovereign that in fact there's any commercial use of those materials. So suppose, I, suppose I agree with you that after our court's decision in the Seppel, that your view about the amenability of the Russian sovereign is set forth for going forward. So the like question here is, what do we do about the fact that there was a lot of stuff that happened in this case before all that, including the original decision from our panel um, way back to tell The Abad one. Yeah, Abad one. So we call it Abad <laughs> one. Um, so that, and the question is, did, did was there a finality attached to the jurisdictional uh, presumptions that were in place at that time that would preclude the ability to revisit that now, even if we thought that your understanding of the shuffle is right as a matter of which we understand. Uh, there, there, no, a court always, and under your one of your more recent decisions, in fact, uh, you referenced this, the uh, Y Oak uh, Tech versus Iraq, a court always has to re-examine its subject matter jurisdiction. And under the Sudan case, in fact, even if jurisdiction was previously raised, if a particular issue of jurisdiction was not, you can still consider that. So we don't agree that in terms of raising this issue, now, when our assets are about to be paid. Hard is this Let's suppose um, jurisdiction is found in a case involving a foreign sovereign. Uh, there's a judgment that's entered, time for appealing that judgment it has expired. That judgment has become final. And that sovereign, after the judgment has become final, collaterally attack it, so to speak, and say, well, really, that was wrong. Laws change. There's no subject matter jurisdiction over us after all. The Would post. That, would that be permitted? Um, the post judgment challenge can be appropriate under certain circumstances. We don't say here the law has changed. We say it was never decided as to the foreign sovereign. Yes, you decided it, and we don't raise uh, anything with respect to the library and the military archive, the other two Russian defendants. We raise that you never decided, nor did the district court decide the subject matter jurisdiction. And therefore, under Supreme Court precedent that we cite, as well as under your own circuit precedent, 
a judgment is void if it does not have subject matter jurisdiction. And this court, if you read um, his order that we are appealing from and his memorandum opinion that is incorporated in it, says I'm not deciding anything else unless I have a direction from the circuit. And by the way, I would need an on-bank direction. But all of your cases, in fact, uh, on the same issue, whether DeShepel, Simon, uh, Phillips, they have gone for unbanked, been denied. Some have even petitioned for cert, been denied. No one disputes what the black letter language. So I think, I think that, that all goes to what the state of the law is now. I think still this question that we've been asking you about um, that gets to what do we do with the, the ground that's been plowed already in this case? Suppose you have a circumstance in which the, as in the first instance, the sworn sovereign comes into the case, makes an appearance, files pleadings, and um, objects to jurisdiction, and there's a hearing on jurisdiction, and it goes really bad for the foreign sovereign. The foreign sovereign sees the writing on the wall and says, and maybe even just says, um, you know, I see where this is going. Um, we're going to withdraw. And so there's withdrawals from the case. And then the case proceeds to judgment. There's a decision made that there's jurisdiction as to that foreign sovereign, and um, uh, the, the judgment's entered. They withdraw, and then they come in later and file a collateral attack and say, "Actually, you know, we'd like to actually challenge the juris jurisdiction." Can they do that? Um, it depends when. If there's been a default judgment entered, so that it's then post judgment, I think at the time that post-judgment, uh, someone is trying to enforce uh, a judgment that is devoid of jurisdiction and its issuance, it must be raised. It's a void judgment. And I, even if what happened was the first time around, the foreign sovereign came in and saw the writing on the wall. Let me. Said, Boy, that, I see where this is going, but you know what? I got another chance. If I get out now, I can come back later after the default judgment's entered, and I might get a second crack at it, and I'm gonna see if the law is better, or I get a different form or something, I'm gonna know. Well, let me tell you what really happened in this case from the record, because I don't think it is as bad as the case you posit. I'm, I'm not saying that it is, I'm not, but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm just wondering where your argument goes, because I guess that's the question, that there is a principle of jurisdictional finality that kicks in in some circumstances. Okay. At and some the question point, does that does that apply here? If you don't even think it applies in circumstances that I outlined, well, then that's that's one argument. But if you do think it would apply in that circumstance, but it doesn't apply here, then there's got to be some basis for us to say, notwithstanding the language and practical concepts that outlines the kind of choice that a foreign sovereign can make, why shouldn't we construe this circumstance to be having made one in which the choice was made, just like it was in the hypothetical that I read? Right. I think we have to refer to the case that we've got before the court. Um, and I think the facts here are compelling because yes, there was participation by the Russian Federation at the outset. And then there was a denial of the motion to dismiss. They filed an answer. They sent a diplomatic note. And in the diplomatic note, they said, you know what, the property is in Russia. It's not in the United States. And they then, in filing a notice to withdraw, said, by the way, uh, you can't get the property that's in Russia. We raise all the FSIA issues. The judge then, several years later, enters the default judgment. He does not consider the FSIA issue raised in the answer, he does not consider it as to the sovereign. He does not consider, in fact, what had been decided in Havad 1. And if you look carefully at the decision in Havad 1, the court only decided as to the library and as to the archive. But the court did refuse to dismiss um, Russia or any of the agencies. It did, but without any reasoning. It didn't consider the issues. 
And in fact, if you look at the words of the uh, end of Havad 1, the full sentence reads, we reverse the district court's finding of Russians' immunity as to the library claims based on the events of. So all that is right. I mean, I, and it's completely consistent with what, we, what, what our court said in the show. That's right. So all of this is right. I, but I don't see how that gets to squarely to whether, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm just, I'm not saying I'm necessarily against you on this. I'm not saying necessarily for you, but it doesn't get to whether what had already happened in your case congealed given the Russian appearance to an extent that precludes a collateral attack on that later. And in our view, Your Honor, it does not. Because we say by failing, this is black letter law in the FSIA. You must have the property in the United States by ignoring the black letter law. This wasn't some extraneous argument about subject matter jurisdiction. No one decided. All that, would, all that could be equally true in the hypothetical that I laid out. Suppose you have a district court that just, and I'm not saying this, this district court did it, I'm just elaborating um, on that. Level. You could have one where the district court just ignored the black letter law. But then what happens is the foreign sovereign comes in and says, I see where this is going. I made an appearance. Um, I'm out of here. I'm going to try to get a second crack and have a better shot. And that, that seems like a, a tricky proposition to stop, but even in that circumstance. Well, even, even in that circumstance, I would say that under practical concepts, under Sudan, you can look post judgment, of course. And even in that circumstance, this circuit has the obligation to examine its own jurisdiction and that of the district court. And there is no existing circuit decision on that other than Pendichel that goes on for two pages saying the issue was never decided. Make sure my colleagues on the other. But, but I'll just take that just a little further. Uh, if you're looking at the Sheffield and it does criticize another panel, it's not overruling the panel. There's no iron footnote. There's no change of law by the Supreme Court. Um, we haven't gone on back. So how do we deal with our own jurisprudence on that issue, even if it criticizes another panel? Well, I think the Sheffield's analysis had it right because what the Sheffield court said is there isn't any inter, you know, really any inter circuit or other split of any kind, and the district court judge recognizes this as well, because the issue wasn't decided. It wasn't briefed, it wasn't argued as to the foreign sovereign. And I read you the only sentence in there just conflates all of the defendants. So there's a non-decision, and I think the circuit law on, on that is, is good in the Sheffield, the Steel Co., the Citizens for a Better Environment. They say, you know, a drive-by jurisdictional determination really is not a jurisdictional determination. They yeah, look at it. It's always known problems with outside the U.S. throughout the whole Yes, yeah, that's... The order, the default judgment order that was issued by the district judge at the outset in 2006 is an order of replevin to bring the documents to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. He knew where those documents were. All right. Thank you. We'll give you a little bit of time for um, rebuttal unless my colleagues have additional questions. We'll hear from colleagues now on the standing in the television. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Uh, the court has appellate jurisdiction because appellants could appeal the denial of a motion without prejudice to obtain uh, denying with prejudice. This is clear from the El Paso case in this circuit and others. Um, Habada has never contested this reasoning, and nor could it. 
Here, the denial with prejudice is uh, what was required given the uncurable jurisdic jurisdictional defect, as Your Honor just referred to, that the property uh, is in the Russian Federation. There's no allegation that it wouldn't be. If the property somehow came to the United States, this would be a completely different case. Uh, because of that, uh, no, no one disputes that the property is in Russia, and no allegation of additional facts would change the 1605A3 analysis. Uh, for that, dismissal with prejudice is required. Um, and Habat is wrong that we are appealing the opinion and not the order. Of course, the portion of the order says it's a denial without prejudice. Uh, we are appealing that. Moreover, the immunity issues that are raised in the appellant's brief uh, are necessarily included uh, in the district court's order on notice under 1610C. Uh, the, under the TIG case, the court had to uh, assess its jurisdiction and immunity issues before getting to a post-judgment issue about notice. Yeah. That's why you make a reference to judicial finality. So clarify, you're looking at this on the claim of inclusion, uh, issue preclusion, or law of the case, just so that uh, whatever opinion we would write, <laughs> We would discuss um, whatever. We, are, we believe that with respect to finality of the subject matter jurisdiction issue, the Bell helicopter uh, case controls here that the, uh, because there was a default judgment, the issue of uh, the, the issue of subject matter jurisdiction has to be addressed. Uh, it, as Ms. Lamb explained, it, it was not final. There was no decision on Russia's immunity itself. Uh, this is very much like the Sudan v. Owens case. And to your honor's uh, question about um, whether where where does it end, uh, we don't need to address that here because a motion to dismiss was made raising some jurisdictional issues. It is very common for a sovereign to raise some issues in the motion to dismiss and then come back later and have additional jurisdictional issues considered, whether that's a first a factual uh, facial challenge to the complaint and then later. Factual challenge. We don't have that here. The, the only ruling on Russia's uh, subject matter jurisdiction issue, what, uh, Russia's immunity, I mean, uh, was in the default judgment context. And because of that, the practical concepts framework applies. There is no law of the case on this issue. Um, and. Can I uh, yeah. on your for one second? So, why do we have a lot of lawyer jurisdiction? Review authority over attachment immunity. As opposed to jurisdictional immunity, given that one of the predicates to collateral order of review is that um, the issue is implicitly resolved. The issue of the so uh, it, within our brief, the two issues of uh, attachment immunity both are conclusively decided. Um, the um, uh, the court um, and well, all of the collateral order factors do apply. And the Seventh Circuit's uh, decision in Rubin and the Fifth Circuit's uh, decision in FG Hemisphere versus Congo are both instructed on this point. Attachment immunity issues are all, uh, also sat can satisfy the collateral order doctrine. We do, uh, the, the main factor is, well, is conclusively decided because Judge Lambert was clear that he has no intent to revisit these issues that we have raised. Uh, he says that the only thing left to decide when uh, he, when Habad uh, removes to attach, is the issue of veil piercing. So those two issues are conclusively decided. Further, uh, they are completely separate from the merits of the veil piercing question or whether there is commercial property uh, identified in the United States. And third, uh, they are um, effectively unreviewable because uh, the whole point of immunity, again, from the property, the property shouldn't have to be attached in order for these issues to be uh, considered. So the point of, uh, of the immunity applies equally here. That is what the Seventh Circuit uh, said in Rubin about attachment of the issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Robert Parker for Elliot Abad. With me at council table is Steve Lieberman. If it please the court, I'd like to take the issues in the same order that opposing counsel took them. Uh, but I would like to uh, uh, start with a preliminary point that seems to have gotten lost, and that is Chabad 2, 
where in Chabad to this court ruled that these parties at appellant's table, that is 10x, uh, that is the same party uh, that's currently represented at appellant's table, doesn't have standing to challenge jurisdiction. Um, they brought us to Rule 60B challenge to jurisdiction. This court addressed that in Chabad too, said they did not have standing. Um, we raised that point in our brief in their reply. 10X said, well, we didn't bring a case under Rule 60. We didn't bring a mo this motion under Rule 60B. Well, then what basis do they have to challenge jurisdiction in the first place? What vehicle did they use to challenge jurisdiction if not Rule 60B? If Russia were here today, Russia itself would have to use Rule 60B to challenge jurisdiction. So if they're not challenging, again, under Rule 60B, they have no standing. That's this court's decision in Chabad too. And by their own admission, they have no basis for actually bringing that issue before the court. But let's assume of your argument that they have no, no standing with respect to the merits of the lawsuit. I mean, they filed a motion to quash, right? That's what we are here to. What does Rule 60 B have to do with asserting a jurisdiction defense to the motion to quash? Your Honor, in Chabad 2, they, they filed a motion to quash. Judge Lambert denied that motion. Rather than file a, an appeal, direct appeal from that motion, they filed a motion challenging jurisdiction under Rule 60B. Judge Lambert denied that motion again. It came up before this court in Chabad 2, and in Chabad 2, the court said, no, you do not have standing to challenge jurisdiction. They're not appealing from the motion to quash. That's long, the denial of the motion to quash, that's long past. They're not appealing from the denial of their Rule 60B motion. The court already held that they don't have standing to challenge jurisdiction under the Rule 60B motion. So my question is, what is their basis for challenging jurisdiction in this case? We don't know. They haven't said. But, I mean, they have to. What's the, uh, they're subject to attack, right? They are subject to attack. So what, how are they supposed to object to attack? Their objection to attachment is that, in fact, what you heard Ms. Lamb say earlier on, their objection to attachment is, we are not the alter ego of the Russian Federation. Okay, that's their objection to attachment. In order to attach their property, we have to show some connection between 10X and the Russian Federation. That's the issue that the district court in this case reserved and did not decide. Okay, 10X said, we're not the Russian Federation. We have nothing to... I mean, I'm being a little glib here, but we have nothing to do with the Russian Federation. We're not them. Okay, that's fine. They can challenge attachment on that issue. We disagree, but that's their position. They're not even taking the position that they're standing in Russia's shoes to challenge jurisdiction. They're saying, you didn't have jurisdiction uh, 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 to address the immunity of that guy over there, Russia. Therefore, you shouldn't be coming after us. But that issue has already been decided, and they don't have standing to challenge. But if, if, if we so put aside jurisdiction finality for a second, just uh, for our mutuals, um, if there were no jurisdiction over Russia, and that argument could be raised now, tenants would benefit from that, right? I, 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 I Disagree with the premise, but yeah, yeah right. but, yeah, but, but, but no, let me. I, I'm sorry. I disagree with the premise in this respect. Let's go back to the basics. The basics are Judge Ginsburg's decision in practical concepts, and she set out a menu of options that a sovereign has when it is sued under the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act. She said, option one is you can appear, you can challenge jurisdiction. You, you lose, you can take a direct appeal. That's it. You're done. Okay. Or the sovereign can say, I don't want to play this game. I'm going to sit out. And if these people can make out a, a, a claim and get a default judgment, then when they try to enforce it, I can jump in and attack and do a, a challenge jurisdiction there. Okay. Those are the two menu items. Those are just the two items on the menu. Russia clearly chose option one on the menu. They appeared, they challenged jurisdiction, 
they lost and they disappeared. Okay, they did not take option two. Okay, they did not. They did not default and not challenge jurisdiction and wait for post judgment enforcement. Okay, so that's where the race judicata issue comes from. Okay, they they had to follow one of those two options. If if I may, um, well, I don't disagree with you that the way the practical concepts formulates laid out in that opinion itself it gives you um, some force to your submission on jurisdictionality. What do we? What about us? So the Sudan case comes along later, and it and it actually cites practical concepts. Correct. And in Sudan, the facts are pretty parallel. Correct. You have a collateral challenge by a foreign sovereign, and it wasn't that the foreign sovereign was out the entire time in the first generation. If you look at Owens, what Sudan did was they took both options in parallel concepts. If you look at the very beginning of the opinion, what happened in Owens was Sudan. There was a lot of back and forth because they didn't pay their attorneys, but essentially, to put it short, Sudan defaulted. When there was a default judgment entered against them, they jumped back into the case and they filed a direct appeal. Okay, that's that's option. Effectively, that that's uh, option one of practical concepts. Okay, you can you can challenge jurisdiction in the main case on direct appeal. I guess either as a as a belt and suspenders kind of approach or to cover their bases. They also filed a motion with the district court to vacate the default judgment. Right. Okay. That's option two right. under parallel concepts. Right? Right. Okay. But there was no race judicata issue. Yes, they were allowed to do that. But there was no race judicata issue there because there had been no final appealed decision. Okay, as there was here. Establishing conclusively that the district court had jurisdiction. Okay. Yes. If, if a party can exercise both options under practical concepts, that's how you read Owens, then it's not an either or. It is an either or in the sense that if you, what practical concepts, the first option is if you challenge jurisdiction, take a direct <laughs> appeal, and lose, you're done. Owens took the direct appeal approach and the collateral approach at the same time. Russia just took option one. Russia just took option one, said, I'm challenging jurisdiction. I'm asserting, and this is very important, Your Honor, uh, we may disagree on Dishapel. But I think there's no disagreement that this, this court, the district court, and this court ruled that there was jurisdiction under FSIA with respect to these claims that Chabad had brought against these defendants. There may not have been discussion about Russia versus one of the other defendants, but certainly the, the, the courts decided that, that, that the district court had jurisdiction over Chabad's claims. That went to final judgment. The district court, you know, this court affirmed that's that's practical concepts option one. And Russia. So one one aspect of practical concepts, at least something that gives it uh, kind of intuitive force, is that you shouldn't have the same party coming back and having a second crack at it. And one of the the distinctions here is that it's actually it's not the same party because it was Russia, and now we have tenants. And that's why they have the standing problem as well, because it's okay. not Russia. But if you take that one, even if we accept that, if you take that uh, over to the practical concepts issue, then there is something a little bit um, odd or anomalous about applying practical concepts and the other cases on which it rested, the Supreme Court case that cited, all of which involve the same party. And here we have somebody else. It is anomalous, but not. it's not anomalous in the sense that there's sort of some concern that 10x won't get its day in court. 10x, when we go back to the district court, we will have to say to the district court that 10x, 10x property is subject to attachment because 10x is the alter ego of the Russian Federation. If we win on that point, that is, if 10x is in fact the alter ego of the Russian Federation, then why should they get a second bite of the apple? Because they're the alter ego of the party that limited in the first case. 
If the district court says they're not the alter ego of the Russian Federation, then the district court will say, then their property is not subject to attachment. So it's not like they're caught in a bind. It's like, they, it, it, it's rather they want to have it both ways. They want to be treated as the Russian Federation for purposes of, excuse me, for purposes of standing and race judicata, but they don't want to be treated as the Russian Federation for purposes of attachment. Because that's the issue we're going to have to decide when we go back to the district. Do you think on the merits of the jurisdictional issue, if a case comes up tomorrow um, and it's filed in the first instance, and it involves these same kinds of uh, facts where it's undisputed that under the way that the general courts look at it, uh, the foreign sovereign, there's no jurisdiction over the foreign sovereign in that the first prong of the commercial nexus part is not met. You'd have to go to the second prong of the commercial nexus prong in order to get jurisdiction of the foreign sovereign itself. Do you think it's actually an open issue in our court? Not that the case would come out, or do you think that's now decided because of the judge? I, I, Your Honor, respectfully, um, I think that Judge Lambert is correct. I think there are two strains of thought on this court with respect to how to interpret 1605A3, the expropriation exception, that if you get to that issue, then it should be decided either by the court on bank or maybe even by, at some point, by a higher authority. So what should a subsequent panel do? So what do you, if, if a panel gets that issue tomorrow, the panel can't say, the panel got to decide the case before it. What would the panel do? I think the, what, I, my advice to the panel would be to go back to the language of the statute and start from the beginning and apply the language. And just ignore the fact that we have a decision that's shuffled that has come along and, and actually wrestled with uh, Chabad One and outlined what it thinks is the lay of the land. The subsequent panel is shit. I, I agree with you, Your Honor, that De Chappelle said that having looked at De Chappelle and Simon, in that, you know, Simon should prevail even though De Chappelle was first. But I do agree also, as I said, with Judge Lambert, that there are parallels and conflicting strains in this circuit's jurisprudence on this issue. May I take two minutes to talk about the attachment issue? Thank you, take a sure. If you do it briefly. Okay. Unless my colleagues have further questions on the rest of it. Okay. And, and, and um, unless the court has questions, I'm not going to address the appellate jurisdiction issue. That's fine. Okay, so uh, forgive me, I appreciate the accommodation, Your Honor. Just with respect to the attachment issue, the, 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 the FSIA, at least to this extent, is very clear. The expropriation section is section 1605A3. It does not have a territorial restriction with respect to where the expropriated property is. That doesn't even make sense. If Russia expropriated a mine or a factory or a building, of course it wouldn't be in the United States. The expropriation takes place overseas. Okay. The, once the court finds that the expropriation exception applies, that there's been an unlawful expropriation, again, there's no territorial limit in that provision with respect to where the property is. We then go, and we look at 1606, which says, once you've found a violation, the defendant is subject or the district court ha has the authority to issue the same remedies as it would as if the defendant were a private party, with the exception of punitive damages, which is not an issue. So the court, I mean, plainly, the district court has authority to order the return of unlawfully stolen property. Uh, it's a replevant action. Um, nobody, you know, uh, I think that our, our, our opponents ignore Section 1606. The territorial restriction comes in after you have a judgment, when there's post-judgment activity. It says you can attach property in satisfaction of your judgment, but that property has to be in the U.S. And we've identified Russian property in the U.S. Our position is that 10x is uranium, is Russian property imported into the United States for commercial purposes. So therefore, um, 
There's no territorial restriction in the statute on the district court's authority to order the return of the unlawfully seized. That's that's there, there, there are other nuances to their argument, but uh, given the time, I'll leave it there if the court has no further questions on any of these issues. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Sam, that's for a minute. Well, I'll give you a minute. <laughs> a quick minute. Um, you need FSIA jurisdiction for both jurisdiction under 1605A3 and for the attachment. And when this court is interpreting the scope of both, obviously you must look at the language of the statute and under the restatement fourth and foreign relations 404, it's clear you don't make extraterritorial uh, interpretations unless there's clear congressional intent. And this is the opposite case. There's clear statement that in fact, it's property in the United States. The um, other point we heard, uh, certainly a lot about the finality, you can't have finality if a court doesn't decide an issue. That's what happened here. The door was open. Thank you, Council. This I think we'll give you the minute that you asked. Your Honors, uh, just two points uh, to clarify uh, one aspect on the history, uh, procedural history of the Owens case. Uh, there was no more finality as to the immunity, immunity, uh, immunity of Russian Federation than there was as to Sudan. Sudan had moved to dismiss and also appealed that decision. Uh, before it defaulted, that decision was also appealed before it defaulted. That's the same situation here, although the decisions on immunity in our case uh, didn't even deal with the Russian Federation. They actually dealt with the agencies and instrumentalities. So as Ms. Lamb said, there's an even less of a determination uh, in this case as to the immunity of the Russian Federation compared to the discussion in Owens pre-default of the immunity of Sudan. And then second, on the standing issue, um, I think that your Honor had touched on this that because 10x USA's uh, assets are directly under attack from the motion to attach, which has been refiled in the district court. So, uh, again, 10x USA and the, these uh, assets are being pursued by Chabad. They don't deny this. Uh, and it's, it's black letter law that a party whose assets are being attacked uh, has jurisdiction, outstanding, I'm sorry, to challenge the underlying subject matter jurisdiction of the court to enter the order that is being enforced against it. That's the Harris v. Cuba case, Aurelius, uh, and the Second Circuit, Karaha Bodas. We have a number of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to all counsel. We'll take this case under search. Case number 23.140, Citizens for Constitutional Integrity, the balance, the Santos Bureau of Adel. Mr. Pettinato for the balance, Ms. Clark for the Good Morning, Council. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Jared Pettinato, and I represent Citizens for Constitutional Integrity. With me at Council table is Dean Michael Meltzner who served as counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in the Lampkin v. Connor case. I reserve two minutes for rebuttal. To enforce our sacred right to vote, Article 3 standing does not require proof 
of how the, the Census Bureau would apportion seats on remand. No plaintiff in an malapportionment case has ever proven the apportionment that a legislature or an agency would do if the plaintiff prevailed at court. The district court required that of citizens, but it did that, although the Supreme Court rejected that argument directly in 1962. It held it would not be necessary to decide whether plaintiffs, whether appellant allegations will ultimately entitle them any relief in order to hold that they have standing to seek it. The Baker versus Carr case. Article three recognizes standing for malapportionment claims as long as the plaintiff presents a close a, an, an apportionment with a closer approximation to the legal requirements. Citizens' calculations show that it's possible for them to obtain new seats, and that establishes their Article three standing. So, what would be the outcome if the court, um, you know, required that the report be withdrawn if the people are all serving? Well, Your Honor, that's a good merits question, and that is a very good remedies question, that the parties would brief, that they would uh, investigate the facts of how that would work. And that's that's far down the line. For now, uh, as long as this court has the power on redressability, and as long as exercising that power has some possibility of giving citizens their seats back, that satisfies the requirement of redressability. And here, simply setting aside and vacating the report would require an applying the 2010 census, and that would give New York and Pennsylvania their seats back. Why would it require the false impacts of the 2010 census? That is the, uh, action, I think it's the action against non-smoking case. That is the practice of this court. Vacater, when uh, a court sets aside under the Administrative Procedure Act 5 U.S.C. 7062, that requires the prior order to restore, to spring back into effect. That is uh, how vacater works. On, uh, There's a lot of sound in the interim, though, that is predicated on the apportionment that occurred. That would, that would be quite something to take us back to before any of this happened. Yes, Your Honor, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. We've been litigating this case as quickly as we can. We could not bring it before the Census Bureau finished its apportionment. We brought it after that, and we've been moving apace. It's not uncommon in malapportionment cases for them to take a, a while. The Supreme Court has voluminous malapportionment cases that are still ongoing. We, they address some this term, they issued opinions last term. The, but these are all ultimately remedies questions that we can address at that appropriate phase. So let me ask, uh, no, I was just trying to say, you, you seem to not believe that you had to put forward any facts with respect to New York or Pennsylvania, their voter registration, their ID requirements, and whether, you know, any of that was going to file to the reduction uh, clause. Um, so I'm just trying to get a sense again of, you know, your remedy, your outcome with respect to this case. Well, Your Honor, under, because we have proven a procedural right and a, uh, and that arises from our zone of interest, arguably within the zone of interest of this of the statutes that where our injury is, we only have to prove some possibility that the remedy could restore and cure the injury. And we have mathematical proof that if the Census Bureau did their reapportionment based on uh, some analyses of the of the data, that it could restore seats to New York and Pennsylvania, or both. And that is what differentiates this case from the from the Cantor case, from the Franklin case, from even the Shero case. Those uh, those situations did not have this mathematical proof. They did not establish the possibility that there was any possibility. As I understand your foundation argument, though, you, you, the way it was um, articulated in briefing, as I conceptualized it, was that this this is easy. Causation is straightforward. There's a report, and then at the end of the day. At least in two instances, uh, we lost seats. Exactly. Yeah. But would would that be equally true if then there's a report, but then the legal wrong you're complained of, if corrected by your own estimation, would actually result in a worse scenario? 
that uh, this is all in, in some manner uh, speculative, as in the Duke Power case, Your Honor. And if and that is the the Baker versus Carr case again. I'm, I'm trying to take it out of speculation. So I'm just saying, let's just suppose that you have a case. Oh, let's just take this case. Suppose that you actually have evidence, and you do the the statistical analysis, and your expert comes back and says, uh, if we assume the legal wrong to be what you assume the law legal wrong to be which is to say the Census Bureau was supposed to adjudicate whether voter ID laws are invalid and uh, assimilate that into the report, it turns out actually that the jurisdictions that you represent would be worse off. Would you say that causation is still established? Because look, all you need to know is there was a report and after that report was filed and a portion report, that was done, we're worse off. Yes, Your Honor. That is all that causation requires. But for causation, the report caused the agreement that comes out of 5 U.S.C. 702 of the Administrative Procedure Act, the data processing case, and the uh, the Ted, this, uh, Ted Cruz for Senate case. So even if correcting my own estimation, correcting the legal wrong that you're complaining of would put you in an even worse position. You still say causation is established. Well, we, we can't prove that it would put us in a worse position. But I'm saying that's the only evidence you have. If, if you, do, you do the report, you even file it. All that Article 3 requires is but for causation, whether the report caused our injury. And it did. Here it did. It is undisputed that that's what it did. Now, if the Census Bureau undergoes this process and it turns out that it hurts us, that's, that would be unfortunate. But that doesn't change our threshold, our ability to get over the threshold into court. So you don't have to show that the, le that the legal wrong you complained of caused the. Correct, Your Honor. Let's, let's look at the, uh, I think the Lujan case. And the Brown case discuss uh, procedural injury based on failure to complete NEPA when uh, issue when you're building a dam. And the court said, of course, you have procedural injury, a procedural right, and you can challenge that because they didn't complete the environmental analysis. So it could happen that when the agency goes back and analyzes the, the dam, that it, it turns out worse for the plaintiffs. They could end up taking the plaintiff's property to build the dam. They were nearby, and that is entirely possible that it could work out worse. But the Supreme Court did not, uh, you know, recognize a procedural right as long as there is some possibility of a remedy, even if there is also a possibility that it might not turn out in your favor. How, how do you articulate specifically the procedural right that we have here, given to you by either the statute or by Section Two? So the, the zone of interest test gives us the procedural right. That's the Pena case by this court. That's also the Lexmark case. And we fall well within the zone of interest for Article I of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, Section 2, for uh, the Census Bureau statutes and for Section 209, which requires the Census Bureau to perform all of the constitutional requirements and references uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 2 specifically, the procedure itself is the calculation of denials and abridgments, which the Census Bureau did not do, has never done, and has stated in a letter to us that it would not do. So that is the procedure that we are seeking. And because we're within the zone of interest, that gives us this procedural right. And the procedural right is what allows us the lower burden of proving redressability. It also allows us a lower burden of causation. We only need to prove that, the, that there are two connections. And this is Your Honor's uh, STP case, the Surface Transportation case from, or Surface Transportation Board case from last year, where you have to prove two connections, a connection between the agency, uh, between the legal flaw and the agency action, and between the agency action and the harm. So that's another way to prove causation here. There's really lots of ways to prove causation. The, district court wanted us to prove it in a particular way, but we think that we don't have to prove it in, in that particular way. We could have proven it in lots of other ways. Here, the most straightforward, the easiest way to prove causation is but for causation. But for the report, we would not have suffered this injury, and that, is, that proves causation. Even if the Census Bureau doesn't allocate the seat? Even if, in the long run, the Census Bureau doesn't allocate the seats, we, we can't prove what they're going to do in the future. That's the, the whole basis for procedural injury. That's the catch-22 that, uh, that the, from, the, uh, from the, the tribal case, from the Ogallala Sioux case, that uh, Chief Judge Garland ruled upon. 
So that it presents a, a if you if the agency doesn't do the analysis, it's hard to prove the injury from the analysis that they didn't do. And so you need to have some way to open that up, and that's what this procedural rights rights do. My colleagues don't have additional questions for you at this point, so we we'll give you some time for a vote. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Sorry. May it please the court, Sarah Clark for the United States. Plaintiff has not met its standing burden. Not only has it failed to grapple with the legal and practical barriers to its ability to obtain redress, it also hasn't shown standing even within the four corners of its hypothetical scenarios. So I just want to start with redress. I mean, we, we just heard a lot about causation, and I have uh, plenty of responses to that, but I want to refocus on redressability. Uh, Judge Childs, I think your question uh, elicited a response that, you know, this is really a merits question, you know. Whether or not anything will happen in the real world, that's not for now. And, and that's incorrect. I think it's important that this court consider uh, that the relief that plaintiff is asking for cannot redress its injury. And it, I, I think it tries to run away from that analysis by saying, we have a procedural right. You just don't even need to think about it. Uh, and obviously, we disagree that there is a procedural right here. And it's certainly not correct that you just ignore redressability. Uh, I can just dig a little bit deeper um, on the procedural issue. So what, what, why would drawing the report and the statement have some impact? A few reasons, Your Honor. So for one, of course, even if the Census Bureau were to be faced with an order from this court that says the last report is invalid, that doesn't mean that New York suddenly has an additional representative or that you know, Texas's two additional representatives just walk out of the Capitol. So there is no kind of real world effect in that sense. Um, and I would also point to the Supreme Court's decision in Franklin, uh, their discussion of uh, the kind of chain of causation between the Secretary's report and the President's statement. So, of course, there they were observing that there likely was, there, there was probably going to be, you know, if the report changed, the president's statement changed. Um, I just want to distinguish this case and say that it's far from obvious here, just because this is a different and more complicated uh, issue. This is not a kind of mechanical correction. This is a uh, intensely judgment-laden analysis that plaintiff wants the Census Bureau to engage in. And I think that brings us back to the redressability. I mean, that might be, all that might be true. Those may be good arguments on the merits as to why. You can't expect the Census Bureau to undertake the kinds of legal assessments that the theory would put forward. But for purposes of standing, we have to assume the legal merits of the uh, theory that's being put forward. Yes, but you don't have to assume that the Census Bureau has authority that it doesn't have or that the court can issue orders it doesn't have authority to issue. So, for example, one uh, sort of fact the plaintiff doesn't grapple with is that the statute uh, directs the secretary to send the tabulation of total population in its report, not some sort of adjusted count. So setting aside the practical difficulties of gathering this information, there are legal barriers as well. And those are rightfully considered in the redressability analysis, not just at the merits. Well, but for redressability purposes too, we assume that the plaintiff's are going to win on the merits. We assume that they're going to win on the merits, but that doesn't mean that the court has any powers that plaintiff posits they might have. There are still practical limits. So if, if a plaintiff were to come in and say, you know, I have an injury, it will be redressed by you. You know, I, I think I should be the Secretary of Defense. My injury will be redressed when you enjoin the president to appoint me the Secretary of Defense. I, I think it, it would be quite reasonable to say, that's not redress we can offer. <laughs> So even if you're right on your sort of legal theory of you, you should be the Secretary of Defense, that doesn't get you there. And, and I think it's quite proper to consider that at the standing stage, even, even if it will it could also be relevant at the merit stage. So, so the district court can do any of this, right? The district court, right, the district court has sort of said, okay, if we're in the world of your scenarios, accepting, you know, that the Census Bureau could do something of the nature you're asking. 
Even then, you haven't shown that you would be better off, that your injury has been caused by the report. Um, and, and I think, you know, they, they relied on causation, but for many of the reasons that, you know, it wouldn't be redressed by a different report. So they focused, I think, rightly on uh, plaintiff's reliance on their scenarios that involve Wisconsin, right? So plaintiff's theory, one of their theories, is that voter ID requirements require adjustments to total populations because they're denials or abridgments. They allege in their complaint, and they reiterated an argument in district court, that states other than Wisconsin have these offending laws and that adjustments would need to be made. Their scenarios three and four, which are the only two that benefit the plaintiffs that they elect, the members that they allege are injured, uh, include Wisconsin only. They don't take into effect any other states, and therefore they tell us nothing, frankly, about what an apportionment might look like if uh, voter ID laws across the country were taken into account. So there's just no way of knowing what would happen. I think uh, this court's decision in National Law Center versus Cantor is quite instructive. That case involved a challenge to the Census Bureau's method for counting homeless persons during the census, and uh, the panel observed, you know, you haven't shown us that you would be better off uh, if a count was done according to how you think it should be done. And in fact, you haven't said how you think you want it to be done anyway. And, and that's, that is uh, also akin to plaintiff here. They say, you know, we don't know how the Census Bureau uh, should do this. We don't know all the states that have denials or abridgments. That's the Census Bureau's problem. Uh, and yet they, they want to take the position that they would be better off. And that's exactly the argument that this court rejected in Cantor. Um, so what, if, if, I, I think that their response to that would be, right, when you don't have any idea how it's gonna turn out, we can't be expected to forecast the future. And so the Bureau, in our view, and the legal merits of it is yet to be tested, should have done X. X was never done. So it's not incumbent upon us to say how oh, it would turn out if X was done. Or we just have to point out that there's this flaw and that's enough to give us something. Right, that's not enough to get them from. Of course, that doesn't sort of uh, free them from the requirements of showing Article Three standing. And if it did, I, I think you know potentially the plaintiffs in Cantor could have been in a different position. We do expect plaintiffs to you know allege at the motion to dismiss stage and later prove uh, that causation and redressability actually exist. And I think you see in their briefs that they you know recognize that their scenarios don't really get them there. That's, I think, why they lean so heavily on their procedural argument and on the argument that, you know, we can't possibly know, therefore, you should just say we have- Wouldn't be a situation in which the only, um, what, what the Census Bureau did is, is give a report that's blank, and somebody wants to say, boy, that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, and then the apportionment just stays the same because there's no, no change in it because the report just doesn't do anything. If someone says that's not what the report is supposed to do, the is supposed to do something. Now, I have no idea what the report would do if it were done. I'm just telling you that a blank page is not a report. What would you say about causation for this? Well, I guess one thing that I would flag is just that it's not clear that we would be in the world of nothing changed because the president has his own independent statutory obligation to transmit uh, population totals and apportionment to Congress. And that's actually what, you know, Sure. Well, suppose the president just says, okay, I, I'm just, uh, because it's, um, uh, the report is blank, I usually rely on this report because the report is blank, I'm just going to, you know, stand over the same stuff that was in place now, that's the portion. If so, someone comes along and says, the president just relied on a blank piece of paper, the paper had to have something on it, and the challenge is, yeah, the paper had to have something on it, and what would you say about causation? Right, so setting aside the because of action issues, I think a plaintiff would need to come in and say, Census Bureau, if you had actually counted the total population of the states, or you know, if you had actually put the total population of the states down on paper and passed that to the president, we actually would have gained a record. So they, they would show that, that there would be some sort of difference in the real world for them if the Census Bureau had complied with you know, whatever plaintiff view is its legal obligation to be in a given case. So they have, Go ahead. I, I just wanted to emphasize that they do have to connect the challenge conduct to the injury. So we don't agree uh, with their suggestion that causation is satisfied just by saying, 
oh, the report said minus one. They need to make a connection between uh, what they're saying the Census Bureau has done wrong, which is, for them is not applying this adjustment, uh, and their injury. And the, the way they try to get out of that, obviously, is by saying procedural injury, we don't have to do any of that. Um, and so I'll just say briefly, this, this is not a procedural injury that triggers the sort of softened causation or redressability burdens, um, right? They, they try to fit it into that framework by saying this is the process that the Census Bureau should have engaged in. Uh, but the kind of classic procedural injury is, you know, uh, environmental impact report, uh, letting me comment on a rule, things that are adjacent to the substantive decision. Here, they're challenging the substantive decision. And, and if it were correct that sort of any process that a defendant does is sufficient to bring it within the, the more lenient procedural injury world, I think a whole raft of cases are very different, including the Supreme Court's line of cases, uh, Franklin, Utah, this court's decision in Cantor. I think those would all look different if the mere indication of a process was enough to bring it into that world. Um, of course, we don't think that even if we're in the procedural injury world that they met that more lenient burden because a part of some of the redressability issues that we were talking about earlier. You also suggest that they shouldn't be here anyway because Section 209 is not the uh, they're not a proper party in that regard. Right. So if we were to get to the cause of action issues, we don't think that they fit within that section at all. They don't have a cause of action under Section 209 because uh, they're not a person within the meaning of that provision, and also because they're not challenging, they're not aggrieved by the use of any statistical method. So that that provision is just, they're not within it, uh, they can't rightly bring a claim under it, and it's designed for a totally different set of circumstances. But you used Olmstead too, which involved a state and organization. So there has been, I believe, a three-judge district court panel that rejected um, state's attempt to bring such a claim, saying you're not one of the kind of listed persons. So that that's certainly one of their problems under Section 209. And then obviously they have the problem of not being uh, aggrieved by the use of any statistical method. I think there they would say, we're challenging the report. The report is an activity. The activity is related to statistics because the Census Bureau uses statistics. And that's just not I think, consistent with the plain meaning of the section. I'm trying to understand who could ever bring a section to case in our concept. Let's suppose the state passes a law that says that anyone who's on food stamps can't vote. We just don't think those people should be able to vote. And so these, let's say, just for the sake of the hypothetical, Wisconsin passes that law, and they're the only state to pass such a law. Uh, and these plaintiffs bring the same lawsuit and say, well, we know exactly how many people are on food stamps in Wisconsin. There's a report since it's had that information. I think they would still have, frankly, the same redressability problems that go to the Census Bureau's ability uh, to do this kind of analysis in the first place. But those that like the, the, this, that's not rock science. Could the Census Bureau Well, that obviously wouldn't resolve the limits on their ability to kind of transmit. So, for one, it wouldn't resolve their limits and their ability to transmit information to the president. They have to report on the total population. Also, what plaintiff 
envisioned, and I think even in that hypothetical, what the plaintiff would be saying is the Census Bureau has an obligation to survey all 50 states, uh, use its judgment to decide what state laws constitute abridgments or denial. So maybe in this hypothetical, they would ultimately determine it was only this Wisconsin stamp law. Um, and then determine with precision how many people were subject to that. So, so within the world of, of scenarios of you know scenario three, scenario two, I think a plaintiff in that situation would be better able to show you know okay if you only remove these people, recalculate, do you think we're better off? They would satisfy kind of that route, but they still would not. I don't think be able to overcome the sort of broader issues with requiring the Census Bureau to do this. It's not so within the that's been, um, In that scenario that, that would have played out, then the case couldn't be disposed of as the district court disposed of this. I think it still could be. I think the causation and redressability inquiry, oh, so, sorry. I guess in that they examine the specific scenario, yes, I think that's a different sort of approach to it. Obviously, we think both would be correct and both would be sufficient to, to be plaintiff standing, both but being, both being the sort of broader redressability problems and the specific- No, that's not what the district court did here. Right, and, and the, versus the specific, what have you alleged? We see that that isn't even enough taken at face value to get you over the causation and redressability. So maybe that particular issue could be um, handled better in a different case, could be handled more precisely. That's obviously not what we have here because they haven't even Kind of narrowed the analysis sufficiently. I guess I'm beyond I'm confused. But you're saying that even in the hypothetical where everyone on food stamps is great, that there will be no redress vote. In a suit brought against the Census Bureau, I think that's correct. That's not to say that there is no the case against. I'm, I'm not sure, Your Honor. It's, it's not clear because of the way that the production clause and the statutory scheme exist. There's, there's no obvious, I think, um, answer to that question. That doesn't... So I have a problem when you make an argument that with respect to a specific constitutional provision, you can't articulate for me how any plaintiff would ever have standing to enforce it. Well, enforce it is a different question, right? That it, one, one of the issues is, you know, who is the correct defendant? And of course, this court doesn't need to go so far. It doesn't need to sort of have a sweeping theory of the reduction clause and who might be able to bring a case. It's sufficient to say that this plaintiff here has not satisfied the requirements of standing and you know we don't know if anyone else you know we don't know what circumstances might be sufficient but this plaintiff has not met the requirements of article three we don't know what defendant could redress but we don't know what government we could provide any sort of redress to this specific constitutional provision in the text well again i, I don't know that this court needs to opine on that necessarily or to speak categorically on that issue. I mean, what we have before is that it's relevant to whether we should agree with you with respect to kind of how to frame what the Census Bureau's powers are and aren't, what our, our powers are, so what we can order the Census Bureau to do. So I guess another way to look at that issue could be through the lens of, uh, I guess, timing, really, timing in, in relation to the power of the Census Bureau. So to contrast in, say, Franklin, Utah, some of these other cases, uh, those cases were resolved before uh, the new portion that took effect. So I think that's another uh, sort of barrier to redressability here that I wasn't Sort of emphasizing enough earlier, that I think also would be sort of sufficient to block redressability and would not require sort of opining more broadly on um, the scope of the Census Bureau's authority. I think the bottom line though is 
plaintiffs can't obtain the, redre- the, the uh, relief that they're asking for, they can't get redress for the injury that they have asserted and relied on. Um, and so there's just no article three controversy here. I mean, we could assume that you're wrong on all your broader arguments about addressability vis-a-vis the Census Bureau and still affirm on the district court's rationale, which is to say, yeah, you can bring a suit against the Census Bureau. Yeah, suppose state adopts a poll tax. And if you have to, and the whole purpose of the poll tax is the purpose is the purpose of poll tax. And um, there should be some reduction in, as uh, Redress for the poll tax, but if you have a plaintiff who Steve, who's showing suffers from the same flaw that the district court identified, it may well be that the theory could still work. It could still be against the census bureau and still go forward. But if the proof isn't there that they'd actually be better off, the scenario with the math out in which they'd be better off, then the district court's not rational. That's correct. That certainly would be sufficient to affirm the district court's decision here. I mean, we would obviously su- suggest that the court shouldn't apply, you know, embrace plaintiff's theory that the Census Bureau is the correct uh, entity to see even in that sort of more limited decision. But but I agree with your honor, that would be sufficient to affirm the dismissal on standing grounds of plaintiffs. And the reduction law says that a portion that shall be reduced doesn't say who, and then there's no enabling statute with respect to the census. Exactly. There's no constitutional, there's no language in the reduction clause or in any statute that assigns this responsibility to any particular government actor. And you're not taking a position on who that government actor is. But you know, it's like 150 plus years later, we still don't know. That's correct, Ron. I, I, to the extent it's any, you know, comfort, I don't want to take myself too far off course, but I think what we know from the history is that uh, to the extent the original, the, the drafters of the 14th Amendment had a vision about who would do this, they thought that it would be Congress making these adjustments. Um, of course, again, that, that is sort of aside from... But, but Congress can't do anything without that. I mean, when the 18th census, 70th census, uh, um, they talk about it in the briefs. I don't know if anyone attached to the briefs the actual form. But the actual forms that the census takers use, you know, had a column where they asked them not to just like where we go to the school, how much money, uh, uh, how much money you have, et cetera. It has, you know, has your right to vote shit. Right. I, the census put the position in that, well, we didn't even really like tell our people to really ask that because we felt like we couldn't really adjudicate, you know, whether somebody's right to vote had been British or not. And so we just didn't even really collect the information. And I think that uh, you know, maybe it was randomly done in some places, but not systematically done. As far as I know, that one time in 1870 was one of the time the census asked the question. Right. I think that history just underscores sort of the, the lack of fit between what plaintiffs want and what the Census Bureau does and can do. I mean, Again, I think Congress envisioned that it would be the one making the changes, and it's one attempt to sort of do this through the census was not successful. So I, I think that it's it's, Bureau does it. They are the ones who are supposed to be counting that. So who better to count how many of the everyone's uh, were denied their right to vote? Right, the Census Bureau is certainly the expert at counting the number of people in the United States. They're not the expert at evaluating voting rights laws or voting rights violations. As the Census Bureau sort of informed plaintiff before the suit even started, you know, talk to the Department of Justice, talk to the Civil Rights Division. They're the kind of experts in terms of voting rights violations. That's not something that the Census Bureau does or is 
well positioned to do at all. They count the total number of people in the United States, and that's what you know. That's what they transmit, of course, to the president when they send along their population. So we should just kind of deduce that um, is this more of a ministerial act? We just count the report, don't do anything else. I guess I, I don't. I'm not saying necessarily that it's ministerial, but I don't think anything would hinge on that sort of difference in this case. I'm just saying the type of task that they do is very, very different from the type of task that plaintiff thinks they should be engaging in. And we would also no additional questions. Okay. Thank you, Council. Mr. Pat, we need two minutes for a vote. Thank you, Your Honor. There's a lot there. I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. Uh, first of all, the, this is what the framers said about whose responsibility is. The census taker will find it necessary to ascertain who were capacitated to vote. That is the Congressional Globe, 39th Congress, first session on page 29 of our reply brief. It's, this is the Constitution that we are expounding upon, and that is an important obligation that the framers assigned in passive voice so that they could make sure that everybody had a responsibility to, to implement it. Shall be reduced was, is past voice in the Bart, uh, the, the, I forget the exact Bart Weiler case, I think is the, the Supreme Court said that means the actor is not quite important. And there, the framers were intending a broad implementation of the 14th Amendment, Section 2. So the Census Bureau recognized themselves in 1870 that it was their obligation. And they have not done it in 150 years. The uh, we've proven we, we've proven that it would change seats. That there is some possibility that it would change seats. And the district court never addressed that possibility. They never looked at our procedural rights to figure out if that was enough. Because they I, I expect because they knew that was enough. They didn't look at it because they made logical fallacies. They said, oh, the only procedural rights are public participation rights. And we know that from the Summers case. But that's not accurate because the Japan whaling case is a procedural right that the Lujan case recognized. And in that case, the, uh, the, agent, the Secretary of Commerce had, was deciding whether to uh, issue sanctions against Japan. There was no conceivable public uh, participation in that. So the district court is wrong on its procedural right. And so there's really, uh, on whether we have procedural rights and there's, we've proven at least some possibility. It's possible also that the uh, abridgment, I see them over time, that the abridgment and the denials that we've identified are maybe the only ones that the Census Bureau will do. We, we don't know, but that's possible. We, it's, we have a blank sheet of paper. I, I see him out of time. Your Honor, uh, Your Honor to be, uh, the Supreme Court recognized that we all took oaths to support, to protect, and defend the Constitution despite political thickets and mathematical quagmires. We request the court to reverse and to remand the case for further proceedings. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to both counsel. We'll take your case under second. Yeah, please. This honorable court has done the guard for Tuesday, April 15th, at 1 30. Yeah, <laughs> 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 